Actually, the Lifecycle Network is very happy to be able to present P Professor Francesca Verones, who will be giving her presentation on LCA and accounting for biodiversity impacts. My name is Dr Jasmine Cooper. I'm a research associate here at Imperial College London, and I'm also a steering committee member of the Imperial Lifecycle Network, and I'm also your chair in today's session. Before I hand over to Francisca, just a few quick words on the network, our seminar series, and a bit on Q&A. Today's seminar is being recorded, so please mute your microphones and please stay muted throughout the seminar. The recording of the webinar will be made available to you and you should receive an email notification on when this has been uploaded to our website. The slides will also be made available and again you'll receive an email notifying you how to access the slides. There is an option for subtitles. If you would like these to access these, you click on those three little dots at the top of Microsoft Teams and then select the option to enable subtitles. There is an opportunity for Q&A at the end of the presentation. And if you do have any questions, please type these into the chat, chat box or chat function in Teams. And my colleague, Laura Landa, she will go through the questions at the end of Francisca's presentation. So a little bit about the network. The Imperial Lifecycle Network aims to bring together and connect lifecycle related research and researchers across both Imperial and externally. Uh, it aims to connect its members to the wider lifecycle com community with the purpose of fostering collaborations and facilitating networking, as well as to share knowledge and contribute towards advancements within the lifecycle field. For further information about the network, please visit our website and consider joining us as a member if you're not already a member. You can also follow us on Twitter and for any UK based Lifecycle practitioners, consider joining the Lifecycle Community UK group on LinkedIn. So today's seminar is the seventh in our seminar series and recordings and all slides for all past seminars are available on our website. So please do check that out. Our next event is scheduled for the end of March. The date is yet to be confirmed, so please do keep an eye out on our website or for our emails. We're anticipating to be able to host Professor Adisa Azapadric from the University of Manchester, who will be giving a talk on LCA and circular economy. Uh, the preliminary date is 29th of March, but that is yet to be confirmed, so please do watch this space, check our web check our website for any updates or sign up to our emails to be notified on when her presentation for when registration is open and what the confirmed time and date is. Finally, moving on to today's speaker. Um, today, can I ask that everyone who's just joined, can you please mute, please? Um, so today's speaker, we have Professor Francesca Verones from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and she will be giving her talk on how does life cycle assessment include biodiversity impacts. Francisca is professor in the industrial ecology program at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and adjunct professor at the Department of Arctic and Marine Biology at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. Francisca specializes in the development of novel impact assessment methods, mostly with a focus on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Francisca obtained a PhD from ETH Zurich in Switzerland and a, a postdoc from the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and has been at NTNU since 2014. She was awarded an ERC starting grant for working on impacts on marine ecosystems from plastic pollution and invasive species and she in 2019 received the Lordise Medal of the International Society for Industrial Ecology for her outstanding achievements in marine in industrial ecology by a researcher under the age of 36. And with that, I'll stop screen sharing and hand over to you, Francisca, if I can figure out how to go back. I think you can just overtake control again. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Share my screen. I yeah. hope you can see my slides now. Yes, you can see that. Thanks, yes. Francisca. Yep. 
Yeah, so thanks a lot for uh, the introduction. So as uh, Jasmine said, I would like to talk to you about biodiversity impacts in life cycle assessment or rather in life cycle impact assessment as well. So, you know, where do they originate? Why is it important to quantify them? An example of like, you know, how can we do that with life cycle assessment as one possible tool, of course, and, you know, a little bit on, on what is uh, still also missing. Now, I don't know uh, the backgrounds of all of you. So first, perhaps a very short refresher on LCA, depending on, on your backgrounds, the methods that, uh, yeah, I guess everyone is familiar with to quantify total sustainability impacts over the entire life cycle of a product or a process um, from, you know, extraction of raw materials to the end of uh, life. So it's also by now, I would say, relatively mature and is quite widely used for environmental uh, management. Now, um, this is a figure of the current um, framework of life cycle impact assessment. And as you can see, we have basically three sort of operational areas of protection today. So these are the three ones here in, in color. So we have human health, we have ecosystem quality, and we have natural uh, resources. And what you also see, just going through this, this slide a little bit, is, you know, we distinguish usually, and I'm sure you, most of you are also aware of this, between midpoint impacts and then damage level impacts or also, you know, endpoint um, impacts. And if we start from the elementary flows over here, so from the inventory, then you see that we have these sort of black dotted lines. They go directly sort of to the midpoints. And then, of course, from the midpoints, you can go to the damage level. So, you know, we have the climate change, for example, in kilograms of CO2 equivalents. And then, you know, we can express this in dailies or in PDF or in species here or whatever uh, on, a, on a damage level. But what you also see, and I just want to point to that, are these sort of like light gray lines that we have in the back here. And this is just indicating that there are models that go straight from the inventory to the endpoint or to, to the damage level. And then an example for this is, for example, for land use, which doesn't really have, um, you know, a midpoint in that sense, or at least it's debated what the midpoint um, has or is for, for that. Um, yeah, and, and just also one thing that I think is a very common misconception, and I just also want to you know, stress this is that very often people have the impression that if they assess something on an endpoint level or damage level, well, it's just one number, it's just aggregated to this area of protection. We just have one dolly, and that is not true. So, we have the damage level still has all the detail of all the impact categories, but it can be aggregated into the areas of protection for you know, ease of communication, for example, and of course, also for cross comparing uh, impacts uh, at, uh, across them. But yeah, back to biodiversity. So everything that we have that is operational on a global level today and is related to biodiversity is in here. So this is in this ecosystem quality area of protection. You see that there are some areas of protection that are not yet operationalized. So we suggested that there should be more, like, for example, ecosystem services, but there is, you know, they are emerging, but it's not really implemented in sort of the big methods yet, mostly because it's hard to have, uh, re, you know, global models that are fitting also in this, in, in, in these frameworks of the big methods. Um, now, before I start to explain how sort of biodiversity impacts are assessed, I need to give you a short definition about biodiversity and how this is viewed or interpreted in a way in life cycle assessment. So, as you may know, the term biodiversity has several layers and this includes uh, genetic diversity, species diversity and the diversity among ecosystems. And we all know that there are huge differences between ecosystems. If you just look at, you know, polar region, rainforest or a desert, we have huge differences between species and then, of course, also uh, large genetic variation. And now just to make this very clear, what environmental systems analysis mostly focus on is species diversity. Why, you might ask? Well, you know, just very pragmatically because of data availability. So 
species diversity is sort of the proxy for most operational biodiversity impact assessments in life cycle assessment. There are now new approaches um, that are being published and emerging on functional diversity, which would, is a great addition to sort of the species richness based um, indicators. But in any case, what we can already remember for, you know, if we're designing sort of assessments or developing new assessments is that it is very important that we take the diversity among these species into account. It is, of course, very different for like, you know, how a tiger or how a frog, for example, are reacting to the same stressor. And of course, it's also equally important to um, take into account the differences in the ecosystems and their composition. And that essentially means that we need to know spatially where the impacts are actually taking place. And that means that we need to work with spatially distributed data, usually with maps and so on and so forth. So there are many species, but you know, where are these spe species? And as you all know, they are not equally distributed and we have also many different taxonomic groups. And here we just have one example for bird species, so the richness of bird species. And we have regions where you basically have zero birds. And then you have regions, you know, where you have more than 600 birds in one sort of pixel. So this is very, very largely different. And then so, you know, how many species you can actually affect is also very largely different. And what is in addition important to understand is that even within one taxonomy group, there's a huge difference in resilience of species. So some species are very widespread. They have very large range areas. They're not threatened at all. They're sort of considered to be least concerned, are doing perfectly fine. Then we have endemic species. We also have other species which are at risk of extinction, for example. And we calculated maps for this. And you can see here an example of the global extinction probability for birds. And what you can also see here is that this is also varying quite a bit in space as well. So that is a third thing that we need to consider when we assess impacts. The absolute richness varies and the global extinction probability of a given ecosystem can be vastly different between the ecosystems. So what are reasons that, you know, why is biodiversity at risk today? What is it really that is affecting them? And the simplified answer here is probably, well, pretty much everything that we do is affecting them in one way or the other. And here are just, you know, really some examples. So we have deforestation, you know, land cover changes, land use changes being one of the top drivers of um, biodiversity change and biodiversity loss. We have agricultural practices, which of course is also land use change, but then you have also other aspects related to it, like you know, pesticide use, fertilizer use, leading to eutrophication, leading, leading to toxic impacts, and so on and so forth. Um, we have, for example, you know, dams that have been built, which are sort of disrupting the river flow. So they're leading to a fragmentation of the aquatic habitat, but also to a change in the habitat upstream because you know, if it's a dam, it's flooding a larger area. So also terrestrial species will lose some habitat. They might have their migratory routes disrupted and so on and so forth. It has a lot of water consumption from these huge open water bodies. Um, so there's lots of impacts related to that. Eutrophication as one example. So, you know, an over, um, well, too many nutrients being available in the water body. Also, of course, other impacts related to the toxic impacts and so on and so forth. This one here has been very much in the media, impacts of plastic pollution. Also there, of course, there's many different um, types of pollution, depending also on the size and material of, of, of the plastic item. So we can have entanglement impacts, we can have ingestion impacts, we can have toxic impacts from, from the, you know, um, well, things that are attaching themselves to to the plastic particles and additives that are in the plastic particles and so on. I don't think I need to say a lot about climate change. One example of climate change can be coral bleaching, but you know we know all the other impacts that can happen from te temperature changes to to whatnot. Infrastructure in general can have an impact. 
for example, if we're thinking about power lines, we can have impacts of collision, we can have impacts of electrocution, we can also there have impacts of fragmentation and habitat uh, disruption and, and well, destruction as well, fragmentation. Um, and since, you know, we're electrifying more and more, we need more energy systems, we need more power lines, so that is an impact that is not to be neglected. Also transport systems, now in this example a ship, we have noise emissions, we have also there pollution emissions, other types of pollution, you know, to leading all sorts of impacts, terrestrial acidification, photochemical loss information, again toxic impact and so on and so forth. I mentioned water consumption already in the relation to the dams, but of course, you know, it's not just hydropower that is causing uh, water consumption, it's also agricultural practices and, um, well, domestic water use, of course, as well, but comparatively much, much smaller, invasive species, urban areas, and so on and so forth. So it's really a, a huge variety of impacts. And basically, we have to take all of them into account in an assessment at the same time because they're all affecting the biodiversity at the same time somehow. And, you know, that is something that we can aim to do with a life cycle assessment, even though, you know, we're far from, from complete. But, you know, we can make it even a bit more complex if we're thinking about, like, what is needed to, to really start developing models. If you think about how much of what we consume in one location is actually coming from that location, and the simplified answer to this question is probably, well, almost nothing. So trade is highly relevant in today's globalized world, and we ship a lot of things from one end of the world to another. So I found one example in, in Norway. So this is meat, this is beef, which has been produced, or like, you know, the cattle has been raised in Namibia, and then is shipped to Norway, really at the other end of the, of the hemisphere in went. So, you know, what this trade means in the end is that consumption in, in one country is responsible for impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems on the other side of the world, also on human health, by the way, but the focus is, of course, biodiversity and ecosystems here. So in this map, so all the blue lines here are showing which impacts Germany is driving. So, for example, due to German consumption, Brazil is suffering three biodiversity threats. Or if we're looking at it from the export side of things, these are represented with the red lines. Um, then, for example, we see that the US is driving 32 threats in Malaysia because they are importing products from Malaysia, right at the other side of the world. So that really means that, you know, our models, they should have a global focus if we want to able to assess the impacts on biodiversity through the entire value chains of products. But you know how bad are these impacts actually? And the short answer there is well they're pretty bad. So humans really influence the environment on a planetary scale. So the five largest drivers for biodiversity loss that I guess are sort of known to most people are like land use, climate change, overexploitation, pollution and invasive species. And all of them are leading to the degradation of ecosystems and to contribute to species extinctions. And of course, basically that, you know, species go extinct, you could say, well, that's nothing new. You know, we have this small, this gray bar here. This is showing a cumulative natural rate of extinction. However, what you also see is that the current rate of extinction rates are orders of magnitude above this background here. And all of this difference is caused by just one organism, and that is humans. So 25% of all species are considered to be threatened with extinction today, and that number is rapidly increasing. Now, this raises, of course, the question, you know, what tools do we actually have available for assessing the impacts on biodiversity? And, you know, just to mention this, there are, of course, many different tools that are available with very different strengths of weaknesses. But one of them is life cycle assessment, and that's, of course, what I'm going to, to talk about. What makes life cycle assessment different from other tools, in my view, is the fact that life cycle assessment can actually assess multiple impacts at the same time and identify trade-offs between 
impacts along the entire value chains because that is I think extremely important that we, when we're looking at these value chains that we're well identifying the hotspots of impact so where geographically but also for which taxonomic groups and of course for which impact category do we have the largest impacts but also like if we change something in a system, if we have scenarios for improvement, are there trade-offs somewhere? Is some impact increasing because I have, you know, now a different scenario or is it everywhere decreasing, which of course is the best case uh, scenario. So I think this is very important because overall we want to minimize the, the entire impact. We should try to avoid to sort of maximize for, you know, reducing only one impact. So we should try to take multiple impacts into account, not just one at the same time. Now, you know, what is the current state of coverage of biodiversity impacts? So let's look at this figure for a little while. And as I said here again, we have the distinction between midpoints and uh, endpoints. Um, midpoints, again, usually having the shorter modeling pathways and endpoints on the other hand having usually larger lar larger or longer uh, modeling pathways but also being harmonized in terms of the metrics use and that makes them more easily comparable to each other if you're looking at the endpoint category now here what you actually see is that there's only one of these dark gray boxes um, that actually contains some you know, models, some light gray boxes. So it's only, and that I mentioned before, it's only the loss of species that is actually really having models available. The other ones, loss of ecosystem diversity and loss of genetic diversity are so far empty, so they are identified as a research uh, demand. Now, if we're looking at this, I would say probably best established, I would say are like, you know, global warming, mostly of course, also on a, on a midpoint, um, then I would say land use and land uh, land well land use consumption, and then I would say also toxicity is relatively immature. Water use, there is a huge uh, you know increase in in models happening, a huge increase also in the coverage of 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 impact and and how well they can actually be covered. Um, so there's a yeah a lot happening, and and this is true for for very many of them on the endpoint, but also on, on the midpoint level. So also for global warming, there's at least three new models um, that I know of that are sort of in different stages of being published. Um, so there's a lot of work that is is going on. But now if we distinguish these impacts a little bit according to the sort of type of ecosystems that they belong to, so if we're looking at terrestrial impacts a little bit, then you know, you can see we're covering quite some impacts that are somehow related to terrestrial species richness. And, you know, even though these models are far from, from per perfect, you know, they're models after all, and they're continuously also improved and getting better as more data and more computational power and so on and so forth become available. Um, but we do cover quite a bit, even though, of course, also the coverage of stressors needs to be improved there. Now we're looking for freshwater ecosystems. This already looks well a little bit less covered, but also there we still have coverage, I would say. What you also see is that there are some which have more like you know dotted lines and not solid lines. And I use these to just indicate that there are more models which one could maybe consider to be more preliminary in a way. So that could either not be used on a global scale or that contain more uncertainty, contain more approximations, um, and therefore, you know, are not also as tested, as well tested as the other ones. So this is also just sometimes because it's very new uh, models. Now, if we look at the marine ecosystem, we basically see almost only dotted boxes. So that means, and that's, you know, that's the good news. Work has started in a lot of these categories, but we're not far enough yet to really have global, robust and operational models for most of these categories. So if you're looking at sort of the existing big methods that we have out there, what do they cover for marine ecosystem impacts? At best, they cover marine toxicity, which for some chemicals and so on is, is also an approximation from the aquatic and terrestrial systems. For some, it's actual data for marine. 
and we maybe have marine eutrophication and that's it. We don't really have anything else. else. So, but, you know, I really hope this picture is actually filling up quite rapidly because there's many people doing research on these different aspects here. But just to, in short, to in a way summarize this previous rather complicated picture, uh, one could probably say that, you know, we covered terrestrial ecosystems in a way, somewhat. Uh, we also do a well, okay, job to cover aquatic ecosystems, but we could consider marine ecosystems as lacking. But if you consider this, this actually also means that we are neglecting impacts that are happening on 70% of the global surface, because 70% of the globe are covered by oceans. And therefore, the oceans or the marine ecosystem is also the biggest ecosystem on Earth that we're just, you know, neglecting in a way. So it's a huge underrepresentation and definitely a lot of work needed there. Now, you know, just as an example, for a very, very simplified LCA, you could look at the impact of one cappuccino. So where do these impacts of one cappuccino come from? So for example, we could have the coffee beans, which coming from Kenya, and then I'm sitting in Norway now, so I drink my cappuccino here, so I would have milk from Norway. So, you know, well, is that it? That's not that complicated. Well, but that's not it. What does the cow eat? Grass? from the area around it, hopefully, but perhaps also maize, which could come from the US, for example, or soybeans, which could come from Brazil. And so you see that, you know, even such a simple thing like a cappuccino that involves calculations in at least four different countries. And we have not even talked about the impacts you know, of the machinery, where is that coming from? We have not talked about the impact of transportation from one location to the other one. So it actually really means we need to have these globally spatially differentiated models. Now, I just wanted to give you an insight into how we model one of one impact category. And the example that I want to use here is land use. And why do I choose land use as an example? First of all, it's highly relevant for species. So land use and land use change, that's the dominant driver for biodiversity impact. And you see this on this, this left graph here. So you have here 30% or so of as the direct drivers of terrestrial impacts are directly from, from a land use change. The same is true also for freshwater ecosystem, which are also affected by land use change and so on. So, you know, 62% of the terrestrial endangered vertebrate species are endangered because of land use. And if you just consider this, you know, more than half of Earth's terrestrial surface has been modified by humans already. So these are really large numbers and that's why it's really re very relevant. So, but in short, what is relevant for developing a model? What I had mentioned now during the talk so far is that it's important to look at species so that it's we have to be in a way species specific. It is important to also be location specific. I said that we need to take into account that some species are endemic, some species are threatened, and therefore there are species that may have a higher risk of extinction than other species. And I said it's also important that we take into account different impact types. So in order to respect all of this, we have collected for this one model that I show as an example, data on the distribution, habitat affinity, habitat suitability, and so on and so forth for more than 26,000 vertebrate species. For 700, over 700 of the terrestrial ecoregions, we have also collected uh, threat levels and um, range areas and so on of all these 26,000 uh, species. And then coupled with information on the land cover and the land use, we can then calculate eight different land use impacts, namely the occupation and the transformation impacts of urban areas, cropland, pasture, and forestry areas. And that in this model is also including the effects of fragmentation. And that makes this model sort of different from other land use models. But just, you know, taking a step back, how do we do land use assessments technically? All the 
land use models that we have are using some sort of species species area relationship. So therefore, this is a very basic concept that is, I think is quite important to, in a way, understand to understand how these impacts are are uh, working. So if you look at this this picture here, this is sort of the original situation. This is a natural forest, so we only have natural. A forest. So if you look at the graph down here, this means this is our original area, 100% forest. We have also um, our you know, original number of species that are living in this natural forest. And you know, so this is then our, our model. This is this, this species area uh, curve. And now what happens if we have land use change? So you see there's a part of the land has been cleared. It's now pasture or agricultural areas or urban areas or something else, but we lost natural forest here. So we lost a certain area. What we have left is this new forest area. And this is and that might be a bit confusing because it's not new, it's just left over. But this is what we call the A new. So this is the new area. And in between sort of, you know, the change from the original area to the new era is everything that has been cleared. Now, if you you know, in principle, just go to the to curve here from your new area, you get a new number of species. And then the difference in species between the original number of species and the new number of species, this is the number of species that we have lost. And this we can also express like this, which is basically the lost number of species is the original number of species minus, and this is sort of the new number of species expressed in relation to the, the areas that we, we have here. So, you know, that is basically it. That's the number of lost species. We know the, uh, we can also make a fraction out of it. We can keep it absolute. That depends on, on the model that we in the end want to have. We can divide it with the, the area that we have actually changed or cleared uh, or, you know, occupied in this sense. And then that would give us the characterization factor directly on an endpoint level in PDF or species a year per square meter, for example, of cropland occupation and so on and so forth. But, you know, the problem is with this very simple classical species area relationship that this model assumes that all species are lost if natural habitat is lost. So if we lose natural forest, all forest species are gone. And we know that reality is more complex than that. So even if we have a habitat change from a natural forest into agricultural areas or urban areas, species may still persist in these modified landscapes. For example, you know, mice and geese, they are known to use agricultural areas. And if you think about foxes, they feel at home or quite at home in urban areas as well. So, you know, they can survive in urban areas as well. So there are different, you know, levels of sophistication for these species area relationships. So we, we have then as next step sort of the what is called the matrix calibrated species area relationship. We can have then a countryside species area relationship and so on and so forth. But we can also have one which is uh, not only trying to take the absolute loss of habitat into account, but also the fragmentation of the landscape. Because if you look at the picture here, you see, well, it's not only that we lost forest area or grassland area, it's also that it's becoming fragmented. Now, to include this fragmentation effects, we have developed what we call the species habitat relationship. And in this species habitat relationship, we use what is called the equivalent connected area. And this equivalent connected area considers the, the, really the spatial configuration um, in an ecoregion by com by considering the, the the patch size, so of every individual patch, so how big is the patch, how isolated is this patch of, say, forest from other patches, and what is the influence of the surrounding matrix on this isolation? So now what we essentially did was take the, the current land cover and calculate for each of these 26,000 species how and if they can get from one patch of habitat where they live to the next one within their habitat range. And for this, we needed to collect information on their dispersal abilities because you can imagine that's quite different if we're talking about an elephant or a mice, a mouse, 
Now, in this figure here, as one example, <clears throat> you see Sri Lanka and you see one ecoregion on Sri Lanka. This is the Sri Lanka dry evergreen forest, and you see the current configuration of forest in dark green and grassland in lighter green. And then in gray, we have cropland and, uh, and pasture there. Um, <clears throat> so you already see it is indeed very fragmented. Now, you have on the right side here a zoom in. And you see here basically what we in a way did. So this is a forest patch. Now, how does a species say this is, you know, a deer or whatever, go from this patch to another forest patch? And this is sort of the, what it always tries to do is to take the shortest way. It will always try to stay as long as possible in the preferred habitat type before uh, going to other land use, land cover types to, you know, where it has less affinity to. But there are, of course, also species that don't have an affinity at all to sort of urban areas. So an urban area or, a, you know, cropland is essentially a barrier for them. So then they would not be able to, for example, cross here. But now, you know, instead of just doing this for this forest patch and related to this forest patch, we also go from this to this one, from this to this one, from this to this one, and then from this to this one and this one. And then we do it for all the grassland and we do it not just for this ecoregion, but we do it for, do it for all the ecoregions and we do it for all the 26,000 species. And you can imagine that this takes quite some time and computational power to calculate. So just for the mammals alone, our server was running for uh, more than two weeks to just calculate these results. And that's then how, you know, such a result can actually look like. So here we have an example of transformation impacts of cropland aggregation between uh, bird mammals, reptiles and amphibians. And you can see that, you know, the order of magnitude of these characterization factors is varying quite a bit. And that shows how important it is to take all these details like different species and different geographical conditions into account. Now, you know, if we know where a certain production step in our value chain actually takes place, like, for example, you know, the, the maize production for my cow that produces the milk for my cappuccino, then what we, you know, we can actually calculate the final impact in a much more detailed way. So here in this map of the US, you have in, in gray, so underlying the colored part, you have the land use intensity for maize production in the US. So there are different regions that produce maize, but with different intensity. And in color, you see then the percentage uh, of or the, the contribution for the different spatial units um, to the cropland occupation impact of maize production in the US. And you can again, you can see, you know, this varies from like 16 to 32% of impact to basically almost nothing. And this is because of a difference in land use intensity. There's less maize produced down here, but also because of difference in the characterization factors. It depends on which species are living in these regions, how vulnerable or how resilient, on the other hand, are they. Um, so this is all this spatial differentiation that we have to, to take into account. And you can really see this makes a huge uh, difference. So, you know, after this example, you know, maybe do something a little bit more practical. Um, I showed before that we still have many gaps to be filled when it comes to biodiversity impact assessments. But how do the different methods that we have so far cover biodiversity impacts. And just to mention this upfront, there are many different methods out there with different models, different assumptions behind the models, slightly different metrics as well. We can't go through all of them, but I will try to give you some very short, in a way, overview of some of them. What I should mention now is that I'm focusing here on what I called the endpoints uh, before. There are, of course, also different midpoint indicators that can lead or be attributed to biodiversity impacts, but some midpoints, they are, you know, they're the same for different areas of protection. So if we think again, as an example for, you know, climate change, we have the kilograms of CO2 equivalents at the midpoint, but these can equally damage human health or ecosystem quality. So there's no difference between the areas of protection when I'm at the midpoint. And for others, and I mentioned that before, there is a debate whether we have a real midpoint since, you know, the models that we have go actually straight to an endpoint for land use, for example. 
So often for land use, square meters is used as a midpoint, but that's essentially the same as the inventory. So is it then a midpoint or not? Or is the midpoint just one? So that's really a discussion, I think. Now, for those where we have the endpoints, what metric do they actually um, use? So I'll come to methods themselves in a second. But in general, areas of protection in sort of large methods that have something to do with biodiversity are called something like biodiversity or ecosystems or ecosystem quality. Um, but what you see is that the metric or the unit that are used on endpoint level in different methods are different. Um, and that I think is very important because, you know, even if they have the same unit, the same metric for the same impact category, there might still be differences because they have different assumptions, they have different modeling steps, different taxonomic groups involved, etc. and so on. But also the results, you know, in different methods will now be indicated with different metrics and therefore that makes it extra hard to compare actually between methods. So this is not actually a very fortunate situation, I would say. For human health, for example, you know, the DALIs, they're pretty much used everywhere, but for biodiversity, this is much more fragmented, uh, unfortunately. So next, this is standing for normalized extinction of species. ANAS, this is the expected increase in number of extinct species, um, species year, uh, species uh, year, PDF is standing for the potentially distributed fractions of species. So, I mean, what you can see is that either it's expressed as a fraction or it's expressed as an absolute number of species. That much we can sort of say, but still there's a difference between species year and ANAS and so on and so forth. And now to make matters with fractions even a bit more complicated, we have this little addition here, global. What does it mean there? So, you know, basically a PDF is not necessarily a PDF. Um, even though the unit sounds the same, the underlying concept of how to arrive at these fractions can actually differ. The main difference is that normally PDFs have been based on local losses, so local um, extinctions. Well, this is, you know, bad enough, in theory, you could still bring species back because on a global level, the species exists. Think about the birded vulture in the Alps as one example that was extinct, but it was still found in the Pyrenees. So you could somehow, you know, bring this back. This is not to say, not, not true anymore, of course, not the case anymore. If we consider global extinctions. Um, so if a method considers global extinctions, it means the species are lost on a globally on the global level. So essentially, they're indicating globally normalized PDFs of species. And how do we do that? Basically, we try to include the glo this global extinction probability of a taxonomic group or a species group as a weighting factor. And here, just very shortly, you see this equation for this uh, GEP. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but just to make you aware of it. And it basically it has two main contributors. So it has this O and it has the TL. So TL, this is the threat level uh, from IUCN to that is measure of IUCN to indicate how threatened species are. So we have six categories, seven if we count the data deficient species as well. So they're ranging from least concerned species to near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and then extinct and extinct in the wild and data deficient. We exclude all the extinct species because we can't do anything about them anymore, but include all the rest. Data deficient species are a debate. Um, they are often treated as critically endangered species with the argument that, you know, if we don't know enough about them, they must be quite rare and probably higher on the, you know, list in a way to, to, get, uh, to get extinct. So this in a way, these are, you know, letters. So you can just translate this to numbers to put it into equation and there's different ways of how you can do that with a logarithmic scale or linear scale and so on and, and so forth. And the occurrence um, is basically indicating it's sort of the pixelized geographical range area that indicates the potential range area, the potential habitat area of each species and is therefore sort of a measure of endemism. And the reason why we include both of them is that, you know, the threat level gives us information about already occurring threats 
while the occurrence gives us an indication on how vulnerable species might be to future habitat loss. And two quite extreme examples for this, um, if you think there's one bird called the green mango, and that bird is endemic to Puerto Rico, so it's very small range, it's an endemic species. Still, the last time I checked, it was still considered least concerned species by IUCN, but it's an endemic species with, with a restricted habitat. So if damages happen in this ecosystem where it lives, that may prove more disastrous than in the, is the case for a more widespread species that could sort of escape a little bit to another habitat. And the use of the, the occurrence area in the GEP basically ensures that small range species get a higher weight there. But at the same time, we have other species that are can be very widespread, like, you know, albatross, for example, this is the sooty albatross. So they're really, really have a very large range area, but they are um, threatened because of interactions with fisheries and numbers are rapidly decreasing. So, you know, there can be these cases of small range species doing very fine and large range species with, you know, supposedly a lot of habitat, um, but being already classified as vulnerable. And that is why we sort of decided to include both these uh, measures. And so in the end, if you have this one <clears throat> and you have um, conventional characterization factors in local losses, then you basically multiply it to get the weighted loss for a global um, assessment. It was an excursion, uh, excursion, so back to how biodiversity is covered. Um, this is an overview of methods that cover biodiversity impacts at an endpoint level. Again, this is at an endpoint level. You can see that, you know, the coverage of impact categories is quite different between the different methods. Also, you know, the age of the different methods is also quite different. So that is also something um, to be said there. So. And even if they both, if they all sort of, you know, take, I don't know, climate change into account or, or photochemical ozone into account, they may still do it differently, have different metrics, have different assumptions and so on and so forth. So, you know, there is quite, um, still quite a, a difference there. But you see that basically we cover climate change, usually in a generic way, so not really distinguishing between ecosystem types. Photochemical ozone, this is mostly only for terrestrial ecosystems. Ecotoxicity can either be generic or really split between terrestrial, aquatic and freshwater. Eutrophication is available either for freshwater or for both freshwater and marine, because in freshwater the focus is more on phosphorus, in marine eutrophication it's nitrogen. Terrestrial acidification, well, it's just that, and that is basically only for terrestrial species. Land use, um, well, we looked at that one. Water use, water consumption is uh, also relevant, and waste is very rare. So that is very, you know, not that only assessed basically by one method. But I think this overview is sort of interesting in a way because you see the different coverages, and you can also see like if you if you're thinking about like what impacts do I want to cover, you have to select your method accordingly. Um, now you know what is again very different is things for example like what's the taxonomic coverage do we only have plants in there or do we have plants and reptiles and mammals and birds or do we only have vertebrates and no plants and so on and so, so that can be very different also what is for me very important again is do these methods provide the characterization factors in a spatially differentiated way or not i was going on about important that is before so to me, that is definitely a very important criterion, which I know, of course, makes life of practitioners much more difficult because, you know, most commercially used softwares do not take fully regionalized characterization factors into account. They may take regions, they may take country averages, but not fully spatially differentiated uh, characterization factors. And the only one that is actually sort of able to do that is uh, Brightway. Now there, you know, just on the keyword of, of software, there are of course different softwares. Um, and, you know, here we see some examples, there might be more also, you know, for the methods here, this is no guarantee of, of completeness here at all. And this is also just an overview that I sort of try to collect, but I, you know, I don't say that this is uh, the complete truth in a way. 
But what you can see is that there's a huge difference in whether these methods are implemented in, in these softwares or not. And what you can see is that this is a, a very sort of Eurocentric view because these are sort of the softwares that are used in, in Europe uh, mostly. And you can see, well, recipe is a method that is heavily used in Europe. So this one is actually really implemented everywhere. What you can see as well is, for example, that Lime is not implemented really, at least to my knowledge, um, really in any of them. And why? Because Lime is specifically developed for uh, Japan. And also a lot of the documentation is in, in Japanese. Also, you see, for example, Impact World Plus and LC Impact, they're not really included in softwares or not in a lot of, of, of softwares. And the reason there is that they're both very new. So they have been published in 2020 and 2019, something like that. So they're quite new. But I know, at least for LC Impact, so that they will be implemented in CIMA Pro, at least uh, the country averages. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure the same is true for Impact World um, Plus as well. Um, yeah, and then hopefully that will also be available in, in Brightway at uh, some point. So just if we're thinking again about special differentiation, then it's Impact World Plus and LC Impact. Those are the ones with which have the largest spatial differentiation available actually. So again, if you use Brightway, you could make good use of that because there you could load into your own characterization factors, actually. So to summarize, what have you learned? Well, species richness and their vulnerability varies a lot throughout the world. Spatial differentiation is crucial when we want to develop models and calculate impacts on biodiversity. Life cycle assessment can help to quantify biodiversity impacts and can be very important for identifying trade-offs between impacts and that can then help us also to minimize actually trade-offs when we want to also reach the SDGs and there are different methods available that cover biodiversity in a different way. So what is then still missing? You saw the figure before, several things. There's really continuous improvement going on but as I said my sort of biggest concern in a way is this 70% of the globe, globe that we're sort of neglecting, so that's the oceans. Um, why do we do that actually? Why do we not take oceans into account? That also there it's mostly because of data availability, but I'm convinced that the big improvements in the next decade in LCA will come from closing this research gap, which is also more and more possible because of more data availability. And that is also what I'm doing my research on. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to some questions. Thank you very Thank much you very for much the for uh, very uh, interesting and insightful um, for, uh, presentation. It's very timely because a lot of discussion about biodiversity is going on in various areas of research and in the society. And there have been many questions. So I will just start in the beginning. Um, so the first question is about migratory species. Where are they considered to be? Or is their migratory range also factored in, in biodiversity maps, for example? Yeah, um, migratory species. There are they, again, they're differently covered in different uh, in different um, impact types. So either, so they are considered yes, first and foremost. But there are there are differences in how they are considered because either there are some models that say, well, you know, at some point during the year they're going to be in this region, so we're gonna consider them the same as any other species, and then there are other methods that say well they're only here during part of the year so we're not counting them as a full species we're counting them as a sort of like as a part of the species because they're only here for like a quarter or a third or whatever of the of the year but they are considered and how would you account for habitat fragmentation habitat fragmentation well, that's what we try to do with this uh, equivalent connected area where you really try to sort of actually begin with the sort of the actual land cover so not just with the amounts of the you know the total amounts of land per ecoregion, region but the actual configuration of the land and then see if species can get to these different patches or not because i mean you can only say it's really an impact if they cannot reach the patch the, the other patches anymore so that was what i tried to show with this figure from sri lanka where we sort of have the path that goes through 
um, yeah, for, for, for every species that we have from patch to patch in its habitat range. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the main driver for the land use? Is it agriculture or forestry or something else? That depends on the ecoregion where you are. Um, on a global scale, I would suspect it's agriculture, but that can vary a lot from ecoregion to ecoregion, depending on what the dominant also, you know, habitat there actually is. If it's forest, then, you know, forestry might be more prevalent as well. But so it depends on the ecoregion ultimately. So you've talked a lot about terrestrial, aquatic and marine um, biodiversity. How about um, airspace encroachments? Anybody looking into this? For example, drones or the effect of, um, of aircraft on the biodiversity? Interesting question. I don't think anyone is working on sort of aircrafts. Um, what we have also been working on, which is sort of like air, not airborne in a way, but what we are also working on are impacts of uh, wind power plants on birds and mammals then, so that then we have sort of a reduced um, set of taxonomic groups that we try to cover at the, at the moment. Um, or like, you know, power lines where you have collision and electrocution of, of birds, for example, as well. But I don't think, I'm not aware that anyone would work on impact of uh, aircrafts. Okay. Um, do you think there is a possibility of translation between the biodiversity indicators, for example, PDF um, square meter year in another indicator, for example? Yes. Um, it can be translated, but I think you need to understand quite well how the different indicators actually, what is really behind them so that you can actually do this transformation. Because for example, you need to know, do I now have a local or a global PDF, for example? Um, because that makes a difference. Do I have to sort of take out my vulnerability score or my, my global extinction probability in the first place before I can then translate it to an absolute number of species, for example. And then there, you can transform it to absolute number of species. The question is always between, um, you know, do we just take one global number of species or do we do that again spatially differentiated? Um, and I just thought one question popping up, the difference between the vulnerability score and the GEP. Well, the vulnerability score was sort of the first, the first attempt. The GEP is the improved version of the vulnerability score. And people were really confused about the name because it has nothing really to do with ecological vulnerability. So we renamed it to global extinction probability. Thank you. What type of data did you use to model the species capacity to move from one patch to another patch? There was dispersal abilities of species. Uh, habitat ranges to first start off, you know, that we know where they're actually living uh, in the which ecoregions and, and, and which part of the ecoregions. We need to know on which habitat types they prefer, so habitat affinities, and then the dispersal abilities of different species. Um, I think we have time for one more question, then we'll have to wrap up. So, so apologies if anyone's asked a question and we haven't got around to ask yet. My apologies. Okay, perfect. I will just go with the next one. Um, outside of a detailed academic study, is it realistic that we will be able to map the supply chain accurately enough to use regional factors? Um, well, of course, I'm completely immersed in academia, so here it, I would say definitely it's possible. Um, for practitioners, I completely understand that this is much more difficult. I think it depends, you know, what, what is the main focus of the study? If the focus really is quantifying biodiversity impacts, I think there needs to be made a certain effort to try and be more accurate. If it's a general LCA that wants to take everything into account, human health and LCA, uh, biodiversity and so on, then of course you can spend much like much less you know time on collecting information for biodiversity. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that was great, Francisca. So again, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank all our attendees for joining this presentation and have a good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And thanks everyone. Thanks a lot.
And if you have any questions that are unanswered, you can also just drop me an email and I can try to reply. Thank Great. You Thanks, Francisca. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good day. Bye.